Welcome you scrub lords to combat mission Fortress Italy. Today we're going to be playing through the clearing the Nishemi Highway scenario. It should be a little explosive. It's July 12th of 1943 and Operation Husky is proceeding as planned. US 82nd Airborne has been dropped behind enemy lines in order to secure key roads and installations leading out of the beachhead, both defending it from enemy counterattacks and securing the route for follow-on forces. One of these units, the 3rd Battalion of the 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment of the 82nd Airborne, has secured the Castelletti Villa, a monastery overlooking the road down into Jela. The previous night, a German mortar platoon was ambushed and destroyed, trying to make its way towards the beachhead. However, now that the Germans know we're here, they are very likely to mount a concentrated counterattack in order to retake the hill, the villa, and open the way towards the Jela beachhead. My mission is simple. I need to hold the hill and the villa in order to deny the use of the road to the Axis forces and allow reinforcements to reach me and inflict heavy casualties upon any Axis forces attempting to force the gap. In order to facilitate throwing me off the hill, there's really only one direction that they can come from. The ridge line here bisects the entire map and provides great cover and concealment for moving up upon the hill. This in theory allows the Axis forces to push their combat power very far forward before I can engage them. Mind with the fact that I have a relatively small force, this actually works out better in my favor than you would think. Because the enemy has to attack on such a narrow front, it means I can concentrate my combat power to where it's going to do the most good. There's just a lot of open ground here in front of the Orchard's objective, meaning that there's plenty of opportunities for my weapons platoon with the three machine guns in the top floors of the villa to slow the enemy advance down and inflict casualties upon them as they move forward. However, the enemy is not likely to charge straight at me. There are a number of other routes available to them that they can take. The first one being the main road itself. It offers a direct and very, very quick route right up to the front of my defenses where they could roll armor up and pound me into submission. The other alternative is through the Western Approach, which comes down through a forest before disappearing into another walled-in orchard. This should provide them with a decent amount of cover from the villa and allow them to close with my forces. Looking over the map from above, it becomes pretty clear where I need to deploy my forces in order to concentrate my combat power. Speaking of which, let's take a look at them. The nature of US airborne operations during World War II means that I'm going to be doing this on essentially a shoestring budget. Allied commanders during Operation Husky still considered airborne forces to be a sort of wondrous uh, vertical envelopment weapon. And airborne operations in the Mediterranean theater were often put together and planned out by people who had no experience in airborne operations themselves. Now, I won't dive fully into the history here, but needless to say, this over-optimism ultimately resulted in untrained air crews flying at night over friendly ships who had no idea that they were there, resulting in one of the worst friendly fire incidents of the entire Second World War. 3rd Battalion of the 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment sounds like a very, very capable force. However, I'm not dealing with a whole battalion-sized force. In fact, my forces are barely larger than a platoon. In all, I've got the Company HQ and its XO team, a platoon HQ with two rifle squads, a 60mm mortar team, two M1919 machine gun teams that are severely depleted, a demolition section consisting of an HQ, a demolition squad, and one bazooka team, and finally my heavy weapons platoon, consisting of the platoon HQ, a bazooka team, an M2HB 50 caliber machine gun, and two M1A 175mm pack howitzers with associated ammo bearers. The M1A 175mm pack howitzer is not exactly what you would call the most glamorous piece of equipment in the United States Armed Forces. Having entered service as early as 1927, the pack howitzer was designed to be broken down into multiple sections in order to be moved by pack animals. The United States Army between World War I and World War II was focused predominantly on developing equipment suitable for the southwestern border with Mexico. Its easy disassembly method and light overall weight 
meant that it was one of the easiest weapons to adapt to airborne operations, as the weapon could be parachuted into an area, reassembled, and then provide parachute infantry with badly needed fire support. While the weapon is not a purpose-built anti-tank gun, it is capable of firing the M66 high explosive anti-tank round, which can penetrate about 91 millimeters of homogeneous armor at any range. Sometime at or after the 15 minute mark, I'm set to be reinforced by a Sherman, two T-30 assault guns, a battery of M2A1 105mm howitzers, and two more M1919 30 caliber machine guns with a forward observer to direct the howitzers. At the 25 minute mark, I'm receiving yet another platoon of infantry, another mortar platoon, and three more Sherman tanks to complete my defenses. Now that we know what to expect, let's begin. Almost from the word go, things start pretty ominously. The very first spot of the enemy forces that I encounter occurs 30 seconds into the first turn, and of course it's a tank. Now, normally this wouldn't be a problem except for the fact that I have deployed my bazooka team well back from the initial front line, as I didn't want them to get initially overwhelmed by either an infantry rush or an artillery strike. In hindsight, this was probably a really bad idea, because no bazooka team, means effectively no anti-tank weapon. Yes, there's a few anti-tank rifle grenades sprinkled in each one of the split-down demolition squads, and they do have demolition packs, but they would have to get rather uncomfortably close to use them. And on top of that, rifle grenade fire in combat mission is pretty notoriously inaccurate. However, this isn't as much of a total disaster as I initially thought it would be. While the captured French tin cans continue to push forward towards my lines, it quickly becomes clear that they can't actually see my picket line from where they stop. What can see them, though, is my heavy weapons platoon in the top floor of the villa. And on the third turn, my M250 caliber machine gun in the top floor of the villa facing that direction decides that it's had enough of waiting and opens fire. The first burst goes high, second one goes low, and the third hits the commander dead center in the chest, practically cutting him in two, and prompting the rest of his surviving crew to suddenly decide that they don't want to be here anymore, and reverse away. First blood goes to the US Airborne. However, there's no time to celebrate, because a few seconds later, the other R-35 that didn't have its commander unceremoniously cut in half, suddenly sees a bazooka team at the other end of the ridge the very one that I forgot to move forward, and immediately starts pounding it with 37mm high explosive grenades. This puts me in a bit of a pickle. Having them get up and move quite quickly is much faster, but it comes with the risk of exposing them to the light fragmentation effects and the machine gun fire of the R-35. Yes, I can move them out of there slowly, but they will get pretty tired doing this, and who knows what else is coming up with those tanks. I've been getting intermittent infantry spots for the last couple of minutes, and it would be rather counterproductive to have them get up and move, only to run into an infantry crossfire. So for now, I'm taking the hard decision to just hide them there and hope that the R-35 loses interest. On the very next turn, the assault begins, with two squads of Italians cresting the ridgeline right in front of my demolition squad immediately being cut to pieces by semi-automatic fire from the M1A1 carbines, Thompsons, and 75mm pack howitzer fire. Despite this fantastic initial result, I had expected this attack to land any minute, so I had already placed my front two squads on pause and then fall back orders in order to keep them from getting outflanked and overwhelmed. I want them to get their initial punches in, but they can't afford to hang around for too long. While this is happening, the Italians are making an armored push down the main road. This is led by two more R-35 light tanks, but more worryingly, they're backed up by a 75mm Semivente assault gun. For all intents and purposes, the Semivente follows the exact same concept as the Sturmgeschütz, taking a tank chassis, removing the turret, and installing a more powerful, in this case, 75mm short-barreled howitzer. While on its own, it's definitely not as impressive as a Sturmgeschütz, that 75 is still more than capable of blasting any of my defensive fortifications that I very well may have, and so it's very much a priority target. Or at least, that's what I think. My 75mm pack howitzer crew, however, 
has yet to spot the Semavente and is currently happily shelling the R-35s, with its M66 heat rounds easily setting them ablaze. However, there is a slight problem with this. While I'm pleased that these two R-35s have been thoroughly dealt with, there's also the remaining issue that the 75mm Semavente is still up and kicking. And as if to prove my point, it spots and begins shelling my engineers as they fall back from their almost complete encirclement up on the ridge. Getting off incredibly lucky when the second shell passes literally between the legs of one of the Pixel Troop and as he stands kneeling after suffering some shrapnel wounds from the very first shell. Had he been in the cowardly fetal position and not standing up like a total chad, that shell would have hit him in the ass and killed him and his two buddies right next to him. This close call had me worried that they were simply just going to get blasted on the very next turn. Luckily, however, the 75mm Pack Howitzer crew was on the ball and gave the Sumavente the proper treatment. While this is happening, the engineer squad is finally reformed at the edge of the orchard and is desperately holding the line against waves upon waves of Italian forces. However, despite the Italians getting within spitting distance, my combat power on the wings is doing an excellent job of holding the Italians back and keeping them from being able to double envelop the orchard position, thereby allowing me to retain control of the objective and beat them off. This does not mean, however, that things are going entirely my way. At the same time, a mortar barrage begins falling on my defenses, and one of the very first rounds knocks out most of the 75mm pack howitzer crew that was defending the right flank. This leaves me wide open to attack, and as if to demonstrate that, on the very next turn, the R-35 puts a 37mm high explosive grenade straight through the chest of one of my bazookas. Meanwhile, things are getting hairy up at the orchard, and as a result I send a couple of infantry teams up to reinforce them to at least keep the enemy at bay until my reinforcements arrive. Which they do, right on time. The first order of business is to get my fire support in the form of the T-30s and the Sherman up to the objective in order to plug any holes in my defenses. However, I am not the only one receiving reinforcements. The Germans have arrived, and they brought Panzers. Meanwhile, the remaining 75mm pack howitzer gunner on the right flank has recovered from the loss of his friends, and is engaging the remaining R-35 with only high explosive, having expended all eight of his high explosive anti-tank rounds in his group's engagement of the previous armored push. The first round merely impacts on the front of the R-35, creating yet another depression in the front plate, but the second round inexplicably penetrates the thin armor of the R-35 and does nasty things to the interior of the vehicle. Only one crew member gets out. Things in the center continue to remain hairy, however. With the arrival of their German allies, the Italians begin pushing forward with renewed confidence. This time, however, they're supported by the two R-35s that we saw at the very beginning. Despite pushing forward into bazooka range, however, it takes three separate shots before the bazooka team finally destroys the first R-35. It's worth taking a moment and stepping back and looking at the overall situation by this point. As my reinforcements get into position, the Axis attack on the right-hand flank is failed, and the left-hand flank is stalled for lack of direct fire support. Enemy infantry is being forced across into the middle of an open kill zone against direct 75mm pack howitzer fire on the left flank. In addition, I've rolled up a T-30 assault gun to infilade the left-hand flank. This allows me to catch the enemy infantry in an L-shape and thereby destroy them in depth. However, with the arrival of German reinforcements, this has effectively reset the playing field, as now I've got to start this process all over again. And this time, the enemy is bringing some quality units to the fight, and not just lowly R-35s and low-quality Italian infantry units. That said, it's not like I lack the tools to deal with it. I now have two extra mobile pack howitzers in the form of the T-30s, and the well-armored and well-armed M375mm anti-tank weapon in the form of the M4 Sherman, all of which are mobile, meaning that I can shift them to whatever flank requires the most assistance, thereby countering any thrust the Axis may throw my way. As the German attack develops, it becomes clear the Germans are making the exact opposite mistake that the Italians did. Instead of pushing up their infantry completely unsupported by tanks, they're pushing up their tanks completely unsupported by infantry. As a result, the first Panzer III walks directly into an ambush 
and takes two penetrating hits to the weapon mount from my M4 Sherman, undoubtedly knocking out the main gun. While this is all going on, the enemy continues to shell the Castelletti Villa, and a stray round finally finishes off the remainder of the pack howitzer crew that had served so heroically on that flank. This artillery is becoming more and more accurate, which leads me to believe there's an artillery observer scoping out that side of the villa. I would love to drop some speculative artillery on that flank in order to potentially silence him. However, I really need that artillery in the middle at the moment. The German infantry has been lagging far behind their armor, but that doesn't mean that they're going to stick around there forever. And now that I have a forward observer and a battery of 105 mm howitzers, I plan to put them to good use. Eight agonizing minutes later, and the barrage finally comes in to devastate the enemy counterattack before it begins. Unbeknownst to me, however, most of the casualties would not actually be dealt in the center, but over in the woods on the left flank. In the meantime, my final batch of reinforcements has arrived, bringing with it three more Sherman tanks, a second platoon of infantry, and finally a platoon of 60mm mortars which I can sprinkle throughout my defenses. Once again, however, I'm not the only one who's receiving reinforcements. The Germans have brought a platoon-sized element of Panzer IV Gs backed up by infantry. These tanks are significantly more dangerous to my Shermans than the Panzer III's with the long 50s. The high-velocity 75mm cannon is capable of knocking out any of my Shermans with a single hit, and from a significantly longer range than the Panzer III's. However, the Panzer IV is just as vulnerable to the Sherman 75 as the Sherman is vulnerable to the Panzer IV 75. And within a period of two minutes, three of the five Panzer IVs are knocked out. With the majority of the enemy Panzer IVs neutralized, I begin bounding forward my infantry platoon on the left flank, as well as bringing in the HQ tank of the Sherman platoon to the center in order to beef up my fire support there and secure the objective. With the majority of the enemy infantry having been dealt with, this is rapidly turning into a mopping up action. Or so I thought. In one final attempt to throw me off the hill, the right flank suddenly springs a leak with even more armored vehicles. This time, however, they're open-topped Grilla assault guns, armed with heavy 150mm infantry howitzers. While normally I wouldn't be too worried about such vehicles, these early Grillas with their low profile proved to be incredibly difficult to spot for my Shermans, and it takes several turns of moving the Shermans back and forth in order to get them into a proper firing position where they can not only have clear line of sight to the target, but also actually see the damn things. In the meantime, the last Panzer IV on the right flank is shut down by one of my Shermans, thereby ending the anti-tank threat from that flank and stranding the infantry that were hoping to get the support of that armor. With the threat on the right neutralized, it doesn't take long to clear out the center, including the final Panzer IV, which is disabled by a 75mm AP round penetrating the weapon mantlet, much like the Panzer III earlier, and thereby knocking out its 75mm cannon. With all of the remaining AT assets destroyed, my Shermans roam free, blasting and shooting up any remaining Germans or Italians still kicking. Shortly afterwards, the AI surrenders, granting me a total victory. In total, I suffered 53 men killed, 30 men wounded, one tank lost, and lost a jeep to a mortar round. By comparison, the Axis suffered 198 killed, 92 men wounded, 1 man surrendered, 12 tanks destroyed, 3 armored vehicles, and 4 other vehicles lost in the fight. While I would love to claim that this was part of some brilliant tactical acumen on my part, a lot of it really came down to simply just waiting for the enemy to make a move. And often the AI made some pretty critical mistakes when as far as supporting its forces were concerned. It didn't concentrate much of its combat power, first of all, instead deciding to spread it out over three lines of attack that couldn't support each other, which allowed me to simply shift the forces that I needed from flank to flank, especially once I had gotten my mobile reinforcements, and concentrate far more of my combat power in any local area. In short, the AI's coordination between their armor and infantry was extremely lackluster. They were constantly sending one or the other, not both at the same time. Sending both at the same time would have made things extremely difficult, as any time I would have popped up to engage their infantry, I could have been blasted by their armor. Bind arms, folks. It's the name of the game. Anyways, thank you very much for joining me in my first combat mission video debut. 
I really hope you enjoyed this after action report and hope to see you again in the future. This video took me close to five months to make. So if you enjoyed it, please leave a like down below and share it around with your friends. And if you are not a subscriber to the channel, consider doing so. I'm going to be making more of these in the future, and so I hope to see you all there. Thank you very much, everybody, and I'll see you next time.